Hello, everybody. We're excited to have you here at Behind the Arch. My name is Chris Betcher. I'm the Associate Director of Alumni and Parent Relations at St. Norbert College. Um, Behind the Arch is a series in which we shine a spotlight on the talented folks of SNC. Um, as they share with you what they know and what they love and sometimes drawn from their day jobs and other times taken from hobbies, pastimes, or their adventures in lifelong learning. Behind the Arch allows us to engage with you, our St. Norbert College family, no matter where you are. Today, I am really excited to shine a spotlight on Dr. Tom Bowling, a professor of theology and religious studies. Tom. Thanks, Chris. And thanks for inviting me to do this. And thanks to you and uh, Billy Fault for helping <clears throat> get, this, uh, get this going. So welcome, uh, everyone. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm uh, particularly excited that um, there are some alums here. So if you were, if you were in a class with me, um, I look forward to connecting with you. So the way the evening is going to go, our, our brief little evening is uh, I'm going to talk for about half an hour uh, around this large topic about what's the Bible for. I have some slides that I'll talk uh, that I'll talk through and, and alongside. And then we'll have a Q&A session, uh, which you can use the Q&A function on um, on your Zoom uh, toolbar. And then uh, after that'll go for about 10 minutes or so. And then after that, um, uh, what I'm looking forward to is we will uh, we'll sort of uh, turn this into a regular Zoom meeting where everyone will will be in on the screen and uh, hopefully um, uh, some former students, uh, you know, we can sort of say hello and, and catch up and, and have uh, have just a nice uh, a nice uh, interaction. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So off we go. Um, so uh, I'm constructing this uh, little talk around the idea of what's a Bible for. Um, you know, most people, if you sort of say, what's a Bible, they can give you an answer in one way or another. But it's a little trickier when you think about what a Bible is for. And I kind of want to, I want us to think about this together, if you don't mind. And uh, there are th sort of three parts of this, of this little, little talk I want to do. And so the first thing is we'll sort of talk about this, this kind of dilemma that um, Christians uh, face when when trying to answer this question, what's a Bible for? That's kind of um, tied into uh, this understanding of what we think a Bible is. So those of you who've had me in class uh, will know that uh, I occasionally will get a little carried away with things. <laughs> and, uh, so, but I'll, I'll try and stay focused. And I have some slides that will keep me that will keep me grounded. So, uh, but the, but let's let's uh, so let's get started. I uh, I made this little. Um, I made this little uh, uh, virtual bulletin board, and I was just thinking about answers. Like if you were to ask people, "What's a Bible for?" All the different answers that people could come up with, and you could probably think of some more to put on here. Um, and I tried to size them based upon sort of the, you know, uh, the the more popular answers in one way or another. So I think of the the people that I've encountered over the years, students and 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 uh, and non students, people sort of say, well, the Bible is sort of a you know a, a, it's for faith in some way or another. And and um, if that seems a little broad or vague, that's kind of part of the what makes it kind of difficult to talk about that kind of stuff. Some people talk about the the Bible as a place they go to for morals or comfort. Um, how to live one's life, right? Some people talk about, uh, you know, the Bible is for, you know, sort of giving me life advice and different kinds of things, or you'd look at role models, uh, things like that. For some people, the Bible uh, gives them history. And so uh, history of antiquity, maybe for some people, even the history of the origins of the, of the cosmos and things like that. And then getting a little smaller for some folks, Bible, uh, some, for some people, the Bible, uh, you know, it reveals sort of hidden knowledge of the future, or secret knowledge about God. The Bible is this sort of mysterious book that gives people knowledge or gives them access to knowledge that other people don't have. Some people might say the Bible should be a foundation for education or should be the basis for legislation. Uh, we, we sort of see that uh, more and more in, in our country uh, today, certainly. Um, most recently, some people uh, seem to find the Bible as uh, some sort of basis for guidance on their health choices and things like that, or, uh, or, or for how marriage relationships should be, um, should be uh, uh, understood. If, you, if you've ever been to a wedding and, and heard the reading uh, from Ephesians, you know, wives be submissive to your husbands, uh, the, you know, that would be, that's uh, uh, one of those examples of that. When we think about this is, you know, depending on which one of these post-it notes you might zero in on, you realize that 
you know, zeroing in on one sort of opens up issues uh, with, uh, with sort of the other ones. And of course, we live in a world where uh, most people are not neutral when it comes to the Bible. And so, uh, and so for, for everyone who looks to the Bible for morals, there's someone who will come and point out things in the Bible that, that you know, don't, don't match with what we would understand modern morality. For everyone who looks at the Bible for historical knowledge, there are people who will come and sort of point out things in the Bible that are that are not historical. We're kind of in this either or kind of a thing. And I think what happens is for at least for for uh, for Christians for whom the Bible is um, uh, an inspired book, uh, we, you get kind of stuck in a corner a little bit. And I and I would and, and we get stuck in a corner between these two choices, right? And that is the Bible, uh, you know, thinking about the Bible as an idea, and the Bible as a thing. And let me explain what I mean by this, and we'll explore this a little bit, and then we'll we'll try and think through this together and see if there's a way uh, to to uh, to be less sweaty than uh, than this fellow here. So, when we think about the Bible as an idea, this is sort of you know if, if um, you know uh, uh, if I were given an exam and I would say give me the one sentence theological definition of the Bible, it would be the Bible is the word of God. Okay, and Okay, so far so good, but to be quite honest, this this definition really opens up a lot more uh, complicated kinds of issues than than uh, than it solves. Uh, like a lot of like a lot of short answers. Let me explain. So, when you think about the idea is the Bible is the word of God, but then you get to the notion of the Bible as an object, a, a thing that you can read, and you notice that as you can see here in my uh, in this little this wonderful little uh, infographic uh, made by Matt Baker, you can see that you know what we call the Bible, this thing, the Word of God, is a whole bunch of writings, right, written by a whole bunch of people that spans somewhere from let's say the ninth century BCE through the first century of the of the Christian era. So we're talking nine hundred years, and so and so we talk about the Bible as the Word of God. And we realize, though, that the Bible itself is um, a collection of writings in, in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, that comes from a lot of different people over a huge span of time. And we can even sort of get a little deeper in this, too, and that is, you know, there, there's, there are multiple Bibles out there. And if you're squinting at your screen, uh, that's mission accomplished. But what you have here, this list here on the left these are all the different versions of, of, uh, of the Old Testament, what Christians call the Old Testament, and the different books that are contained in them in different, um, among different religious groups. So where you kind of see like the red would be no, the green would be yeses. And so you see there's a lot of difference, especially when we get down to some of these books that are down here. And I just zeroed in so you could see there are multiple Christian traditions we're talking about. Most of us know Protestants and Catholics, right? But then there's a whole world of Eastern Orthodox tradition. There's a whole world of churches that you know uh, most of us have never heard of, although they're the oldest Christian churches out there. The you know the Coptic Church in Egypt, the Ethiopian Church, right? So 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 to, to say that the Bible is the Word of God is certainly a theological th uh, a statement that that talks about the Bible as an idea. But when we get into the nitty gritty of of looking at the Bible, what we find is there's a book of eight or nine centuries of writings from a whole bunch of, of different people in multiple languages, and that uh, the, this collection of writings is different uh, among different Christian groups. So part of what the Bible as an object does is it makes this theological, the Bible is an idea issue problematic, right? Because the problem is that, you know, and I'm underlining sort of the words that I think are, 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 uh, are, are complicated or problematic in this. And that is, of course, the Bible, because there are multiple Bibles out there. And so you can simply say, well, the Bible is my Bible, but um, there, there are a lot of people for whom their the Bible is another kind of Bible. To talk about word and singular is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, creates um, an interesting kind of tension because the Bible, of course, is made of multiple words, not even multiple words from a single author, but multiple words from numerous authors, most of whom we don't know. And then, of course, the issue of, of God's role, right, in, uh, in somehow um, uh, being behind or endorsing or being accessible through this nine nine century long collection of texts from lots of different writers and so that's that's where we sort of uh, christians sort of get uh, put together you know get uh, um 
cornered in this notion of the Bible is the word of God, the idea of the Bible, but then the, the Bible as an object, the reality of the Bible interacting with it is often um, something that uh, they find um, uh, conflicts with this idea. And let me give you a couple of examples. So let's talk about the Bible as an idea. Politicians, of course, love to be religious and politicians across parties. So here's an example. This goes uh, back to the couple of presidential election cycles ago. So we have then uh, candidate Donald Trump uh, you know, is asked, what, what's your favorite Bible verse? And he, and he quotes this, this uh, he, well, he, he says Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and he says, never bend to envy. And the problem, though, is that that, that verse isn't in the book of Proverbs or, or anywhere else in the Bible, for that matter. And so, uh, as you can see, this you know this uh, created some uh, a, a couple of web articles that uh, you know uh, uh, you know paid for ad revenue <laughs> for, for a couple of things. But equal opportunity, right? I, I'm not I'm not just singling out one side of the political spectrum. We find that uh, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi has has done the same thing when she's asked, uh, you know, um, you know, what's your favorite bit of biblical wisdom? She gives this quotation, but the problem is that it's. It's not in the Bible. She says, I can't find it in the Bible. I quote it all the time. I know it's in there someplace, you know, it's and and so, and you know, but but it's not actually not in there someplace. So what's my point about this? My point is that we have an idea of what the Bible is, right? And that idea of what the Bible is oftentimes uh will uh lead us to think about the Bible as a book that has contents uh, of, or has content of things that, that isn't in there. You know, I was once having a conversation with someone who said to me, you know, it's like it says in the Bible, to thine own self be true. And I said, well, actually that's Shakespeare, that's from Hamlet. And the person's response was, well, you know, it's the same thing. And so there's this sense of, so the, the idea of the Bible is the word of God, I think for most people, for many people, right? Their default idea is that the Bible is this book that tells me how to live my life, um, it gives me, you know, moral advice, and so there's guidance, and uh, and it's usually in in fancy language because it's the Bible. So like, to thine own self be true. That you know, it's Shakespeare, but it sounds like Bible, right? Or you know, this notion of you know uh, uh, to minister to the needs of God's creation to ignore, you know, and so and so there's you know there there's something that sounds biblical, right? And so there's that that idea of the Bible as um, as an idea that sometimes. Um, uh, butts up against or or has a has a has a a little collision with the bible as a, as a thing in that regard so let's move a little bit forward though let's talk about the bible as a thing so i have a picture of a bible here right maybe i'm 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 picturing all of you in your living rooms with with food and and whatnot but maybe you're there's a bible in in the room where you're sitting in right now and you, if there is just go and take a peek at so there's so the bible is a thing right a book that you can hold in your hands and i want to just give you a little taste of sort of, of uh, what's behind this notion of a Bible as a thing, okay? So here's just a picture of a Bible. And all I've done is I just, uh, I just picked a verse from the Bible, okay? And I picked the verse from the book of Job. It's Job chapter 19, verse 25. It's a very famous verse. For I know that my Redeemer lives and that at last he will stand upon the earth. And this is, uh, this is uh, um, I think this is a beautiful Bach concerto. I know that my Redeemer lives uh, um, and things like that. And so what I've done is, this is a page from uh, a Christian Bible. You see it says Old Testament, which is a Christian thing. And he says, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I want you to notice that the word Redeemer here is written with a capital R, printed with a capital R. Because, of course, for Christians, this verse, right, Redeemer with a capital R, there's only one there's only one uh, figure in Christianity for whom Redeemer with a capital R is applicable to, and that would be, and that's Jesus. And so that's how Christians have read this. And so even though the book of Job is 500 years older than the birth of Jesus, uh, this is how this has been read. So we get this capital R in here. But have you ever wondered, where does this come from? And where it comes from is this printed book. And this is a printed Hebrew Bible. And right here, while I'm, where I'm moving my arrow, you can see I, this says here, I know that my Redeemer lives. But where did this printed book come from? This printed book is a printed edition of this manuscript. And this manuscript dates from the year uh, 1009. So it's about 1,000 years old. And uh, it's, a, it's the oldest complete Hebrew manuscript of, of the Bible. 
and it's in the Leningrad Public Library, actually. And so here I've put a little yellow box around. I know that my Redeemer lives. So there are steps involved. And of course, in these steps, especially you know, in between the picture of the English translation and the picture of the, of the Hebrew text, what you have is you have people who translated this, right? And so they're sort of in between you and the author, right? And then, of course, you know, God is somewhere else behind this for, uh, in, in a theological sense. But let me go a little deeper. Look at this. Okay, so here's our, here's our Christian Old Testament page, Redeemer with a capital R. Here's our Hebrew, and here I have, I know that my Redeemer lives, is right here. And then here on the right-hand side, I have an English translation from, uh, the, uh, from the, um, the New Jewish Publication Version. So this is, this is the English translation used by uh, 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 Jewish Americans. Okay, and of course the Hebrew Bible is Jewish. It was written by uh, ancient rites and and and, uh, and early Jewish scribes. And so you notice here that in Judaism, it, instead of saying my Redeemer with a big R, it has my Vindicator, and there's a capital V here too. And part of this is that in Judaism, this uh, this th there are two things worth worth pointing out, and that is in Judaism. Um, you know, the notion of a redeemer in Judaism with a capital R is something that that is foreign to Judaism. And in Christianity, there's a sense of a redeemer uh, of Jesus. And so vindicator is sort of a, a, of, a, a, of a way that uh, Judaism sort of uh, looks at this verse in a way that's distinct from the way it's been read by Christians for a long time. But also, the Hebrew word here that's being translated redeemer or vindicator has a wide range of meanings. And a redeemer could be a family member who steps in to help you when you're in need. It was really a, a redeemer was someone who, who uh, uh, had a moral obligation to help you when you were in need, and that was usually in extended families and things. And so, what you see here in these three in these three uh, slides, if you were these three excerpts from a text, is we have this is this is a text that's ultimately 2,500 years old, and the notion that we translate as redeemer can mean a person in, a, in your family, your extended family, who has a moral obligation to care for you. What we see that in, in Judaism, we see that it becomes a vindicator with a capital V. And, and this, of course, is meant to uh, refer to God. In Christianity, it becomes a redeemer with a capital R. And this, of course, is a traditional uh, reading that this refers to Jesus. And so, when we when we when we're confronted with the text of the Bible, what we find is this really in, I find this interesting and not distressing. This really interesting complexity, and this interesting insight into the different ways that people think, which I think is really important. Let me go a little bit further. So let's talk about the Bible as a as a thing. And you see here, I have this beautiful image here. And here at St. Norbert College, we're very lucky to have one of 200 and only 299 copies of what's called the Heritage Edition of the St. John's Bible. And so um, the monks at St. John's Abbey in Minnesota for the new millennium uh, commissioned a beautiful handwritten, hand illuminated Bible on parchment um, that took several years to complete. And then they printed 299 um, really high, high, high resolution printed editions of this. And St. Norbert is lucky enough to have one of those 299 editions. It's seven volumes and we have these beautiful cases and these seven volumes are at different locations on campus and, uh, and they're just wonderful. And so here you're, you're sort of thinking about the Bible as an object, as a thing. And if you, if you look at this, right, it's this big, beautiful book. And even if you had never heard of a Bible before or, or didn't even know English or anything, if all you, know, all you would need to do is look at this and think, well, whatever's in that case must be important. OK, because it, it, it's displayed in this way. And so the Bible as a thing is, on the one hand, this book, you know, that's translated uh, from other languages and that is, is read in different ways by different religious communities. And here there's also the thingness of, if I can use a, a made up word, the thingness of the Bible here in this beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, edition. I kind of want to just put these two side by side. So on the left, this is just a, one of the uh, one of the Bibles I teach out of. Uh, well, I don't teach out of it very much anymore because the print uh, somehow the print seems to get smaller uh, as the older I get. And then this is a page from the Book of Revelation from the Saint John's Bible, and so you can kind of see the different ways, right? So Bibles are for different things. So you can see I've highlighted a bunch of stuff in here for when I'm teaching, and here you have this 
this beautiful illustration and uh, uh, these illuminations here. And, and it's just a, you know, it's just a, 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 a tremendous work of art, but they're both Bibles. Okay. And I did this on purpose is the, the, the page I'm opened up here to uh, in my little teaching Bible is from the book of Proverbs. It does not say don't bend to envy though, because that's not in Proverbs. And that, of all the books of the Bible, Proverbs is one of the books that's kind of fits people's understanding of the Bible most, because Proverbs is just pretty much direct advice to you. Do this, don't do that, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Revelation, the book of Revelation is a series of extremely symbolic and in places disturbing and violent imagery of, of uh, the destruction of the world and the creation of a new one. And, uh, and so it, it, it's, I would, to be quite honest, I would put it as one of the sort of least uh, accessible books of the Bible for people. In the Catholic Church, the book of Revelation is not read very often at mass, and there are only a handful of places that are where it's read. It, there's a beautiful passage about, uh, about the end of death that's read at funerals, but there's a lot of revelation that just never, never gets off of the bench or, or, or comes out of the bullpen because it's not very accessible. So here we have you know, a sort of a, 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 a idea of a Bible as a tool, right? Something that you use to help, you know, to help you learn something or to help you uh, gain some sort of goal. And here we have the Bible as this beautiful object, this beautiful thing. You wouldn't obviously wouldn't be highlighting in, in uh, inside the St. John's Bible. Let me try and bring this together. And I'm, I'm watching our time and I seem to be doing okay. Here's St. Augustine crying in the garden. And I want to I want to I want to show you how St Augustine gets caught in this notion of the Bible is the word of God and the Bible is an object. And I kind of want to show you something about Augustine that's strange. And I want to and then I want to end this talk by sort of giving us some giving you some advice from St Augustine I think would be helpful. And so uh, so this is St Augustine this is from uh, his Confessions which is his autobiography and this is the moment that Augustine is converted. He wants to become a Christian, he knows he should become a Christian, but he's not ready to. And specifically Augustine um, loved uh, he he was um, he loved being important. He was the official rhetorician to the Roman emperor. He uh, he loved uh, he loved women. Uh, he didn't want to. He didn't want to give that up. He loved uh, the status that he had. He loved all that kind of stuff, and he knew that it wouldn't make him happy. But he was afraid to let it all go. And this is the moment of his conversion. And here, and I want to show you what he says, though. So this is this is a. Uh, he's crying in a garden, and then he says that he says, you know, I suddenly I heard a voice from next door. It was a boy's voice or a girl's. I don't know. And it was singing, and it was repeating again. And it said, "Pick up and read. Pick up and read." In Latin, that's tole lege. It's a very famous thing. And so look at what Augustine says he's going to do. He says, I stopped my tears and I got up and I took this, this kid's voice chanting. I took this to be no less than a divine voice commanding me. And look what Augustine do, does to open a book and read whatever passage I first came upon. And so he goes back to where he'd been sitting. His friend Olypius is there. And he says, I'd set down a book of the apostle. And that means Augustine had a little book that was the letters of Paul from the New Testament. And I snatched it up, and, he, and that, that, that Latin verb is like, look, I snatched it up, and I opened it, and I read in silence the passage that first caught my eye. And then at this point, Augustine reads the passage, and then he, he surrenders to God, and he converts, and it's very famous. Um, some of you probably heard of this before, but, I want, but this is important. What, what finally allows Augustine to, to, uh, you know, to surrender to God and engage in this conversion, we might say reading the Bible, but he's not really reading the Bible in a way that we would read. He's sort of using the Bible as, as almost like a, like a, 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 a device to sort of uh, like, like almost like flipping a coin in the sense is like, I'm going to grab this book, I'm going to open it, and whatever my eyes land first, right, that's, that's going to tell me what I ought to do. Okay. And that's most of us, the overwhelming majority of people don't read the Bible this way. And it's foreign to us. But for Augustine, this was something that people did. And I want to just trace this historically back a little bit. And then I want to come back to Augustine. So Augustine didn't invent this way of reading. Uh, Christians read like this. We have lots of evidence of this. And, and uh, part of the reason Christians read by, lit, like this is that, is that, uh, uh, early Jewish people read like this too. So this is from the, the, the first book of Maccabees, which is in Catholic Bibles, but not in other Bibles. 
And this is uh, Judah Maccabee is a general in the Jewish army, and they're going to go fight the bad guys. And uh, and they're outnumbered, and it's it's all you know uh, things are are um, are looking pretty dire. And in the ancient world, before you went to battle, you always uh, engage, you always had some sort of ritual where you asked the gods if you stood a chance, right? You asked the gods if you, you know, should we go to battle or not, okay? I'm, I'm wondering, you know, to be quite honest, the, the Packers ought to engage in that ritual before they host another playoff game because whatever they're doing now doesn't work. Um, and so here, Judah Maccabee, look at what it says here. It says, so that day they fasted because they're, you know, they, they, they put on sackcloth and ashes because they want... They want God to help them, you know, win this battle. And then look what they do is then they unrolled the scroll of the law. And the law, of course, is the, the first five books of the, of, of the Old Testament, the Torah. But look at what it says. They unrolled the scroll of the law for the same reasons that the Gentiles, meaning non-Jews, consulted the statues of their idols. And so what Maccabees is telling us is that this, uh, the, this group of, of, of uh, devout Jews in 164 BCE is that, you know, in, in the same way that, an, you know, what we would call, I guess, a pagan or a non-Jewish person in antiquity would go to a statue of a god and say, you know, tell me what to do and maybe offer a sacrifice or, or ask an oracle or a prophet to give them a message. What, what, what the early Jewish community did is they unrolled the scroll of the law to consult it. And so what they're doing is they're kind of doing what Augustine did with the book, is they're unrolling the scroll and sort of letting their eyes fall where they will and taking wherever their eyes fall, okay, as, as sort of God guiding them to a part of the text that tells them what they need to know, okay? And just think about that for a second or two. And of course, early early Jewish uh, uh, um, early Jews didn't invent this themselves. They got this from this was sort of standard practice in the Greco-Roman world. This is my favorite picture tonight. This is a papyrus. You can see it comes from Egypt, and it comes from the fourth. It's from the fourth century, but this this practice is really older, and it's literally called a Homeric oracle. Okay, uh, that's what that's what it is here. And you'll notice. So this is in Greek, and these are lines from Homer's Iliad, which maybe you read in ninth grade, um, you know, Western Civ. But I want you to notice, you see these little squiggly lines here that kind of look identical? These are actually numbers. And the way this is set up is you're supposed to, um, you're supposed to have three dice with you. And you take the three dice and you say a little prayer to the gods that they guide you. And you roll the dice, and whatever three numbers appear on your dice, you find them here. And when you find the number you're looking for, you read the line from Homer, and that will sort of tell you, give you the answer to your question or tell you what you want to know. Okay. And so this is the end of this. So the scribe has sort of written this, made this little thing, and it's like, this is the end of the Homeric uh, uh, oracle. And so what we see here is, um, in the ancient world, right, what's a sacred text for, right? And, and what Augustine is doing and what the Maccabees are doing and what a bunch of, 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 of uh, Greek speaking um, elite folks who could read are doing is they're, is they're sort of saying, the idea of the sacred text is that it somehow guides my life and the, the, the thing of the sacred text, um, I reconcile that to the idea that the text guides my life by because I use the thingness, the actual sacred text that's in my hands, and I use it in this way where I open it or I unroll it or I use dice or something to lead me to what's seemingly a random part of the text, but it really isn't random because I've been guided there. And so that's one way that that we can bridge, right? The idea of you know the the Bible is a, a, the word of God, but there are all these different words in there. How do I know? that I'm at the right words that God wants me to know. So let's get to the last point. I, uh, I'm not going to advocate that you run over to the Bibles in your living rooms and, uh, you know, and flip them open and just randomly point at things. But I do want to point out something, and that is what Augustine did and what the Maccabees did and what, and what whoever uh, used that papyrus in Egypt did is they're, they're really engaging in an act of reading. Right, you know, and, and as Dwight tells us here, right, you know, a book doesn't speak, it doesn't say things. A book has to be read, it has to be interpreted. And let's come back to Augustine again. And I'm, I, uh, and I will, uh, uh, we're coming around the home stretch here. 
So if you come to St. Norbert, and if you're an alum, I hope you come by soon. And I'm, I'm still in the same office. I've been in the same office for 20 years. So if you, uh, if you were a student of mine and you ever came up here to this office to, I don't know, ask for an extension on a paper or something, the, the carpet's the same, the paint's the same, the bookcases are the same. So come on by. But on the door of our church, uh, uh, right next door, Old St. Joe's Church, we have this beautiful bronze uh, uh, relief. And there's Augustine. You see, he's wearing his bishop's hat and his bishop's crook, and he's riding. And then here, he's running away from his mother, Monica, in a boat. We we learn all this stuff. And I want to come back to Augustine. Augustine wrote a book, one of the oldest books written by a Christian on how to make sense of the Bible. And in this book, Augustine says, how should we make sense of the Bible? And Augustine says, well, I don't know. Like, what would Jesus do? What did Jesus do? How did Jesus read the Bible? And Augustine goes to this passage from the Gospels, okay? And that we find this in, in all three, uh, all Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But I, I pick Mark because it's the oldest of the Gospels, and uh, and, and I kind of want to uh, get get back as far back as we can. So Jesus is in the temple, and and a scribe approaches him, and a scribe would have been someone who copied out. Um, uh, uh, scrolls of the Torah, scrolls of the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, okay? And scribes were highly trained, and they would have probably had huge chunks of this text memorized as they copied the books, scrolls of the Torah out. To this day, if you've ever been to a Jewish synagogue, they have a, a Torah scroll, and a Torah scroll is written on parchment, and to this day, Torah scrolls and synagogues are written by hand by trained scribes. And so the scribe comes up to Jesus and he says, which commandment is the first among all of them? Okay. And this is a very technical question because the scribe would have had the entire Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the law memorized. And traditionally in Judaism, there are 613 commandments in the Torah. And so the scribe goes up to Jesus and says, okay, you know, there are 613 commandments, right? Which do you think is the most important? And I want you to notice what Jesus does. Okay. Jesus says, well, the first is, and then Jesus quotes Deuteronomy 6. The hero is your Lord, your God is the Lord. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, mind, and might. But then Jesus gives them a second one. The second one is, and then this is from the book of Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus says, there is no other commandment greater than these. Oh, sorry. And I want to just sit on this for a second or two, because look at, first of all, the scribe asks him for one, and Jesus gives him two. And Jesus seems to be saying that both of these are the greatest commandment. You ask for one, but these two, right? There is no other commandment greater than these. So it's a tie for first place because they really go together, right? Because what, you know, essentially what Jesus is saying is, the scribe says, what's the most important commandment? And Jesus is saying, essentially, love God and love your neighbor, right? It's kind of all one commandment because really you can't love God if you don't love your neighbor. That's how that works. And Augustine says, this is how Jesus interpreted the Bible. Someone asked him, out of all of the, out of all of the commandments, out of all this text, right, what's the most important? And this is what Jesus answers. So Augustine says, look, whenever you're reading the Bible, Augustine says, you should read it like Jesus. And Jesus says the most important part of the Bible is love God and love your neighbor. So Augustine says, no matter what part of the Bible you're reading, your interpretation, whatever you think that part of the Bible is, is saying, however you interpret it, it somehow has to teach that we should love God or love our neighbor. And Augustine says, if you're reading the Bible and, and, uh, and you come to an interpretation that, that, doesn't, that doesn't guide you to love God and love your neighbor, then you've done it wrong. And Augustine knew that the Bible had a lot, I mean, Augustine had pretty much the entire Bible memorized, we can tell that from his writings, and he knew there were parts of the Bible that, you know, it would be really hard to, to kind of get to this place, but Augustine doesn't let you off the hook, and he has this beautiful line, and I just, this is my, uh, I'm, I'm uh, next to last slide here, Augustine says, yeah, this is going to be hard, and so it takes work right? And he says, you have to take pains, okay, this word diligent, you have to be diligent to turn over and over in your mind what you read. So you have to, you have to work at this, right? And, and you have to, and you can't quit until he says your interpretation of this, whatever biblical text it is, and he has this great line, is led right through to the kingdom of love, Augustine tells us. 
And I think if we're going to talk about what a Bible is for, I can't think of a better uh, answer given where we are um, at this moment in time uh, than Augustine's saying that whatever a Bible is for, you need to uh, wrestle with it and work with it to get to a place where you and me and everybody who, uh, who look to the Bible are led right through to the kingdom of love. We, we're, in a, we're living in a moment in time where there's a tremendous amount of, of uh, anger and vitriol and polarization in the world. Um, there's a tremendous amount of anger and vitriol and polarization in our country and inside the American Catholic Church. And, um, and I think Augustine um, is trying to shout above the din and try and say, you know what, um, if, you know, if, if, uh, if Christians stand around this book and we think this book is a, a place that we, that we all stand in common, then we have to do this work here. We have to do this hard interpretive work. And, uh, and, and, you know, um, I think uh, Pope Francis is someone who, who gets this and understands this. Uh, we've had a couple of great panels here on his uh, encyclical from uh, a couple of years ago for Telly Tutti. I would urge you to read it. You can get it online for free at the Vatican website. But what, what, what Francis talks about in this encyclical letter is dialogue. And for, and for Francis, dialogue is this work of love that Augustine's talking about. It's sitting with people we don't agree with. It's sitting with people who are different from us and in acknowledging those differences and doing the hard work of really listening to them, to listen, right? To understand how things look from their perspective and not necessarily always deciding that we're gonna agree or even coming to some kind of compromise, but really, really just taking the time to acknowledge their humanity and to listen to them. And that's the hard work of love. And that's the hard work of interpreting um, the Bible as a book that brings us to that place of love. And so, um, so that's, the, that's the end of this. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn off this slideshow I hope, and uh, I'm going to, all right. And if you want, you can start asking some questions and I will look at them and answer them. So um, so if you wanna ask a question, feel free to type it in the, uh, the Q and A thing and I will watch them, I will watch them come up. Um, Okay, so Anne, hi Anne. It's good. To, it's good to hear from you again. So Anne uh, is asking uh, is asking a question about um, uh, people who take the Bible literally. As far as a response to that, I guess you know, Anne. If I want to model what um, what uh, I just was talking about, I think it's important when you you know when you encounter people. Well, first of all, in Catholicism, the Catholic Church, the official teaching of the church is that uh, uh, not all of the Bible has to be taken as historical fact, and that goes back decades and decades and decades. Um, but I think when, when someone, if when you meet someone for whom the Bible has to be taken literally or historically, what, what they're saying is that, is that they place a lot of worth in the truth value of the Bible, but they're also saying that their understanding of truth is, is, is that if something didn't happen, it can't be true. And so you're sort of, so on one hand, um, you know, when I encounter a person like that, I think, well, here's, we both have something in common, and that is we think that the Bible is a place where one can find truth. What we don't have in common is our understanding of truth, uh, is that I have a, I have a an understanding of truth that things that didn't happen can necessarily convey truth in lots of different ways. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a starting place. I find that there's really, um, there's, you know, uh, psychologists have, 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 um, have articulated this in studies over the years, and, and perhaps you, Anne, and other people have sort of noticed this, uh, you know, um, uh, in your own interactions with people, but if, if you disagree with someone and you give them some sort of evidence that, you know, that, that is contrary to what they think, what often, they're, what often happens, and it's a, it's a defense reaction that we all have in our minds, is they essentially just become even more embedded and entrenched in their own, um, in their own viewpoint. And so for me, I think a, a more a healthier way is to sort of start out with what you have in common. It's like, you know, yeah, the Bible contains truth. 
um, and you're listening to that person sort of convey that they think the Bible contains truth, and that's a place to start. And then you can, you know, talk a little bit about how, you know, or I would, how I have a different understanding of truth than you do, and take it from there. You can also, as the as the uh, as the the ancient philosopher Diogenes said, you can also get up and and walk away <laughs> as well. Um, any other questions? <laughs> 